Representative Slater. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to the committee members. I appreciate your time this evening. Um, I want to say that this is a very important piece of legislation, very important to me. <clears throat> it's a piece of legislation I've been submitting for um, at least, I want to say, eight years, maybe ten. I, um, and um, it's, it's called, a, the acronym is PIP, Percentage of Income Payment Plan. And uh, I also want to thank everyone who came out. And uh, the, I know you mentioned there's a lot of folks here that have been waiting. And, and uh, I talked to some of the folks that helped all organize and put everyone together. And, uh, you know, if there's duplicate testimony to put it in writing. And I know the committee members get it just so that you know. And um, to try to consolidate some of the testimony. But why support? Why should you support PIP? <clears throat> Percentage of income payment plan ensures that utility rates are affordable for low-income households and helps alleviate the shutoff crisis in Rhode Island. Affordability and credits to consumers, to customers, consumers' utility bills determine using tiers based on income level and type of energy use. With affordability, with affordable energy burden ranging from 3% to 6% of a household's gross annual income. <clears throat> PIP programs help make sure all have access to affordable utility service. Under a PIP, low-income households pay a fixed percentage of their income for utility bills. This percentage depends on federal poverty level of that household. In order to have fairer utility rate structure, those with the lowest incomes should not pay the highest percentage of their income for utility bills. Right now, Rhode Islanders living under the federal poverty line you routinely spend higher percentage of their income on utilities compared to higher income households. Reduces eligible households energy burden to an affordable percentage of income. Eligible to households at or below 150% of the poverty level who are eligible for LAHI, Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program or enrolled in Medicaid. <clears throat> a PIP plan would allow the people with the lowest incomes to pay a more manageable amount for their utilities and help stop the shutoff crisis. Each year, thousands of Rhode Island households are put through the trauma of utility termination due to unaffordable bills. Too many go weeks without access to basic needs. PIP helps alleviate the shutoff crisis in Rhode Island. <clears throat> and uh, it would also help with these families that uh, go through the shutoff. Uh, I don't need to tell you what, uh, when I say trauma, what happens to these families is they just get pushed into other, other areas where they, where, whether basic oxygen and different levels that they can't access and uh, it forces them to hospital stays and other more costly stuff to, to Rhode Islanders. Um, recognizing that utility service is a basic and essential element to adequate public health and housing. PIP programs help make sure all have access to affordable utility service. Has PIP worked before? Does PIP work in other states? Yes. Rhode Island was one of the first states in the country to implement PIP in the late 1980s. It was successful for several years before being phased out due to cuts in federal LAHI funding. The current bill learns from different PIP in states such as New Hampshire, New Jersey, to propose a bill that works best for Rhode Islanders. Currently, over a dozen states such as Ohio, New Jersey, New Hampshire, and Maine has successful PIP programs. In Illinois, for example, PIP lowered 90% of the elderly's customers' heating bills, more than any other utility assistant plan did. Um, I'd also like to thank in past years, I, I, I've been able to work to share a lot with uh, Rhode Island Energy, and I appreciate their um, their openness, and uh, we're able to put together some calls and conference calls. And I will submit this to the um, to the committee. I have a slide deck for you, Chairman, that um, I, I'll submit to the clerk. And um, um, basically, it's from Pennsylvania, where they're currently putting in a PIP program for the PPL utility. Um, and this goes through examples of what they're doing over there. Um, and then also, um, I know we held the bill for further study, and there's definitely a few language changes to match up to the Senate version. And uh, when I talked to Rhode Island Energy, um, one of their concerns was about the start date. And um, I'm willing, as long as they're supportive, to push that 
for for a little bit further too, so they can get a good program in place. And uh, I'll submit this to the clerk. Thank you, Representative Slave. So, um, just so you said Ohio, New Jersey, Maine, and was there one more state? Ohio, New Jersey, New Hampshire, Maine have successful PIP programs. Okay, thank you. And, uh, you know, I know you've been a great advocate on this issue and you've done some great work on this. Yeah, thank you. I think he said Illinois as well. Rep Representative Newberry. He did, I think he did say Illinois too, right? Scott? Illinois as well? Yes, yeah. So, yeah, Illinois. So, Scott, I have a, I have a question about yeah. this. And there's no question that if this were enacted, it would help people, especially to lower end the income scale. No question about it. And, um, you know, my biggest concern with this isn't that aspect of it. It's not the financial piece of it for the utilities or for the ratepayers, because I think we need to do something to help people for all the reasons you articulated. Yeah. And I am not a big brother advocate by any stretch of imagination. I, the last thing I want to see is government monitoring people's electrical use. You know, pretty much they do this in Europe for other reasons, climate change reasons. They, there's restrictions sometimes. I think in Germany, I've read about them putting restrictions on how high your heat in your house can go and so on. But if people are on a fixed payment plan, they don't have an incentive to conserve. That's just human nature. I'm not being critical of people, but many of us have lived in, in uh, like for example, assisted living. My mother lives in assisted living. She can turn the heat up to wherever she wants to because she pays a fixed amount in rent and covers everything. If you live in a lot of apartments or students in dormitories and so on, what do those other states do, if anything, to work on conservation? Because I don't want to incentivize people to not, I mean, I'm lucky I can afford to pay my utility bills, but precisely because I can afford to pay them, they're not cheap. I'm also very conscious of what I set my heat and electric to. I mean, I have to be. And so does anybody who's on a, fi who's fi on a fixed budget. So what do we do to prevent people from being hum normal human people when they don't have an incentive to conserve, they, they won't? I think part of the program <clears throat> and in the slide deck, there's more information in it. And uh, Camilio is here from um, George Wiley Center who's been working and some, some folks from the uh, Justice Center. Um, but I think... What it's done, it's not only just the bills that are monitored, I think it's the usage to be involved in the program. I don't think you can have spikes in uh, the usage without having your payment plan reviewed or, or monitored. So it's not like someone can just be like, oh, I got, I'm in the PIP program. I'm going to open my windows and blast the, blast the heat, you know? Um, I mean, no, that's my question. I'm yeah. not saying people go out of the way. I'm not insinuating bad motivations. Just yeah. we're all human. People are going to do things like no, that. No, I understand what you're saying. Got to be some restrictions. <clears throat> Other states must have restrictions, too, or they, must have some way to do it. They definitely do. So I don't know the exact language that they use in the program, but um, I do have this slide deck that we went over, and uh, I'm sure others might be able to answer that a little better than I can. But um, I do know that our utility rates have been going up so much, and, and not just... The elderly, people on fixed incomes, it's just so difficult. And um, it ends up leading to so many other problems. We talk about homelessness. We talk about housing. Um, if someone does have a house and, and are paying high rents right now, um, just having an affordable plan <clears throat> and <clears throat> even with the financial piece of this, it would be capped on whatever is on anyone's rate payer bill. So it would be capped at a certain amount, so, to allow folks to get into this program. Thank you. <clears throat> Speaker Pro Tem Kennedy. Representative Slater, so, in reading through the committee <clears throat> documents, I saw something from Cynthia wilson Frias talking about the fact that PPL does have, uh, already in the process of developing this uh, program, and the PUC most likely would want to take a review of that. But I'm also seeing the uh, the letter from the Director of Government Affairs, uh, Nicholas Ucci, saying that uh, Rhode Island Energy is amenable to a process by which the utility would file a proposed percentage of income payment plan program design with the T PUC by July 1st, 2024, after which a PUC review process would commence. As you most likely know, they're already starting to begin the next process of figuring out what our rates are going to be for this coming winter. I know how many people from my district complained about how expensive electricity is uh, cost this past winter. Uh, it was the highest rates that we've ever seen in the state of Rhode Island. So in this particular thing, it looks to me like they're agreeing to take a look at this to the extent that the PUC were to approve a PIP design through such a review process, we respectfully ask that the program implementation coincide with the approval of electric and gas distribution companies' next general rate filing. 
there are two important reasons for this. Rhode Island Energy is currently transitioning from, I think National Grid is currently still sending out the build, uh, bids, uh, bills for us. So they're building their own billing system in order to support future implementation of a PIP program. And integration of a PIP within a general rate case allows the company, regulators, and stakeholders to more holistically account for rate impacts. So I think they're agreeing to look at this, but I'd like to know what the overall impact is going to be. I know when we passed the, um, the Henry Shelton Act, yes. everyone's bill went up in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, everyone had to pay 20 bucks in January on their bill in order to help the uh, people who couldn't pay their bills. That's for your electric. And you also had to pay 20 bucks if you also had uh, natural gas to help those who couldn't pay their natural gas bill. What's the bottom line here? If a finite amount of electricity is going across the wires in order you know, to bring in the electricity, is my rate going to have to go up in order to reduce everybody else's rate? Because nope. I already feel <clears throat> I'm paying plenty for my electricity rates. No, no, I, <clears throat> I understand what you're saying. But what I will say is that what happens, as you know, when we do, I mean, when you look at the energy companies and the, and the rate filings and the PUC, I don't know if you've ever been to a rate, uh, when they had the rate increase and the rate filing and they have the testimony. <clears throat> if folks cannot pay their bills, low-income folks and, and elderly and people on a fixed income, what happens is, is they don't end up paying it. So this allows people to pay. The, even like the Henry Shelton Act that we passed, it allowed people to have a stake in the game. It allowed them to, to set up an agreement to pay and to get, and to get, because what happens? You, I don't. The utility company is not going to take that on the chin. You're going to take it in the next rate filing, the uncollectibles. So you're going to pay one way or the other. This allows folks that want to stay in their home that do not have the income to pay these high rates and high bills, to to pay what they can afford and to have a stake in the game and to to have some some ability respect. And, and and pay all their other bills that they have around us. So so that's that's where I come from is I think even though it might be an upfront fee on folks' bills, is that <clears throat> in the long run you're gonna end up paying anyway if people cannot pay their bills or, or have a, have the ability and, and have shut offs. You pay in other ways. I mean that's just <clears throat> Representative Potter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, comment and a question. I just want to say I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, Rep Slater, thank you for a really important piece of legislation. I know how hard and long you've been working on this, and you have always been a very passionate advocate for low-income people and the less fortunate, and that is much appreciated by myself and I'm sure many other members, so thank you. Secondly, my question, um, do you have a sense of how many people this would actually benefit as it's written right now? So <clears throat> I don't know the exact number. I mean, they might, some folks that come after me might have more of the numbers on the exact amount of, of people in Rhode Island, but it would benefit those that are already in the LAHI program and also pe folks on Medicaid. Um, yeah. So I don't know, know that exact number that we have in Rhode Island, but. So I'll look forward to the testimony that we <clears throat> hear, and if anybody knows that, I, I'd be... And then it also would matter how the program is set up. Yeah. You know, so after... This allows a program to be set up between um, the get, the utilities in the PUC, and then however that's filed and set up, um, which would be reviewed by others, you know? Yeah. Um, if anybody that's watching this right now and knows that, I'd be really interested in hearing it. The way that I, I read this bill, I would just say that I think this is a very reasonable and very moderate step that we can take on this. We're talking about somebody uh, being 150% or below of the federal poverty level, which is roughly $20,000 a year for an individual, and qualifying for LIHEAP and or qualifying for Medicaid. Um, these are 
significantly low-income people in low-income families. And I think this is, again, a very moderate first step that we can take. I really hope that we move this bill this year. Um, and I think that we can continue doing that work and expand this in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, thank you thank very you. much for your thank testimony you, today. Um, we'll take up David Valiz and Nick Ucci. Okay, while they're coming to the podium, uh, Bishop Carolyn Brown from the George Wiley Center signed up in favor, not testifying. There's a few people that signed up, but unfortunately I can't read their names, but I'll do my best. Uh, Lydia Peoples from the George Wiley Center signed up in favor, not testifying. Is David Valise outside? I know there are a bunch of people outside as well. Nick, you may proceed. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicholas Ucci. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for Rhode Island Energy. And appreciate the opportunity to comment today on H5847. Rhode Island Energy has been in touch with the bill sponsor, the PUC, the Center, and the Center for Justice, and is supportive of a path forward for PIP that includes PUC review of a proposed program design and ultimately implementation of any approved PIP that coincides with the company's next general rate case. Uh, you heard some of our comments from Speaker Pro Temp Kennedy uh, just a moment ago. And we have submitted additional comments for your consideration in writing. And we stand ready to work with the committee, Deputy Majority Leader Slater, and others to create a productive path forward uh, for this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, is there anything you could add to about, you know, I know Representative Newberry had said about energy efficiency. Uh, are you familiar with any other states that do something similar? I, I don't have direct knowledge of that. We'll certainly take that back and, and see if we can get some information. I know energy efficiency is contemplated in this legislation. I believe the last clause of the bill uh, notes uh, the importance of integrating energy efficiency and offerings uh, for customers who might apply for this uh, or, or qualify for this program. I'll also, if it's okay, Mr. Chair, um, Rep. Potter asked about um, you know the, the coverage of this program. Now we don't have a design in front of us, and as uh, Rep. Slater said, I think that would change based upon how that program is structured. Uh, but as of today, we have about 61,000 confirmed low-income customers uh, in in Rhode Island. So uh, you know some portion of that, uh, certainly those who are covered by LIHEAP, uh, I think would anticipate it, we would anticipate those being included or covered by a PIP design in, in, in some form. Can I respond to that? Thank you. Um, 61,000 low-income individuals? Customers. Customers. Right. Um, so that's more individuals because there's only one. Families. Right. Um, and out of that 61,000, they all would not qualify for PIP based on the Medicaid or the LIHEAP requirement as well. I think that's correct. And, you know, again, ultimately, depending on the program design, um, and from the utility standpoint, how do you define low income? Um, let me get the qualifications to you directly. The, we, we do today, and I, I think this is important context as well, getting back to, to some of the comments we heard from the committee. You know, today we do offer a variety of programs to support customers. So depending on your income level, we offer a 25 or 30 percent discount on the utility rate. Uh, we have a rarage forgiveness uh, program in place. We do provide uh, at no cost, if qualified, energy efficiency services to those customers. And so one of the comments that we've provided uh, in, in response to the draft bill, it, it, taking into account uh, the implementation, uh, in design and implementation of a PIP within the next general rate case so that we can account for holistically all of our existing offerings, uh, stakeholder input, certainly the, the, you know, the, the PUC and the division, uh, and to try to thoughtfully design a program that controls costs for all other customers. I, I think that's a, you know, a very fair concern, uh, but also meets the intent of um, you know, what, what Rep Slater and others have advocated for here tonight. I think that we'll be having many more discussions regarding this topic, so if you could provide some research too and follow-ups on a lot of these. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. David? And while David's speaking, I can tell you Adam Shuck from the George Wiley Center, you can come on up, and I'll just, um, Peter Nightingale and Daisy Benitez can be on, on lineup, so. Uh, thank you, Chairman and committee members. Uh, my name is David Valise. I'm the director of the Rhode Island Interfaith Coalition to Reduce Poverty. We're a coalition of faith leaders from many different faith traditions all over Rhode Island that are fighting 
poverty and inequality. Um, I'm also the environmental justice chair of the Sierra Club in Rhode Island, and I'll be testifying on, on behalf of those two organizations. Um, as you will hear from many of the advocates who are here, uh, thank you to Rep Slater and the George Wiley Center for all their work on this campaign. Um, utility rates are ridiculous. They are too high. And as a coalition of advocates who fight poverty and, and work on poverty issues, we already know that housing insecurity, food insecurity is on the rise. Since the pandemic um, has magnified all of those different issues, uh, we see uh, historic utility rates, uh, rate hikes as well. And we believe that no family should ever make the decision of whether to pay their utility bills or buy food or pay their rent. Uh, I just came from another committee where they're discussing housing bills. Uh, we know that rent is also too high. Everything is too high. We believe that uh, you, uh, no family should make that choice and also that utility companies are pretty much run unchecked uh, when it comes to the rates that they are making people pay. Um, I will also say as a, uh, as a environmental justice chair of the Sierra Club, this is also a really big environmental justice issue for us because when we think about the conversations we're having about uh, moving away from fossil fuels, more dependence on green energy, uh, electric, electric for um, specific, specific for this case. Um, we must also think about how different rates are impacting specific communities. And the truth is that the higher um, the higher the rates go, it's disproportionately impacting communities of color and poor communities. So because of that, we take this. Um, we support uh, the passage of five eight four seven. Uh, we believe that we need to have this system in place so that people are uh, not breaking uh, their house and their home to pay utility bills. Um, and I'll leave you with this. Uh, as a coalition of faith leaders, we hear all the time that God is love, right? Uh, God loves you. Uh, God bless you. And I will put this to the committee that we must start showing God's love um, in actions, not more than prayers, more than thoughts, and passing policies like this one that would really go move a long way in fighting poverty and fighting inequality. Uh, so thank you uh, for your time and for, for listening to me testify. Thank you. Next witness. Hi. Is the red button up? The red button has to be up. Uh, red, yeah. but red button's up now. Uh, I uh, basically just wanted to uh, quickly echo some of the sentiments made by uh, Representative Slater. Um, the first thing I really want to, you know, make clear is um, Representative Kennedy mentioned, like, what's the bottom line? Uh, the bottom line is, you know, um, it's the, this legislation's meant to prevent shutoffs, utility shutoffs, which have, you know, uh, generational impact on people and the cost associated with, you know, a little bit of a, a rate hike on, you know, people's bill. I think the max is $10 uh, throughout the year. I could be wrong on that, uh, the specific number, but it's a very small amount of money that um, most Rhode Islanders, if they're not included in the coverage by PIP, that they would have to pay um, to make up for it. And I think Slater also mentioned <clears throat> that one way or another, we're going to pay for it, whether it's when it goes to collections or whether it's through this. Um, and Representative Ponder had asked uh, the numbers. Uh, Senator Whitehouse had put out a document um, that indicated that uh, Medicaid recipients, uh, also including those who applied for 2023, should be adults 120,000 in the state of Rhode Island. So that's a the sizable um, constituency uh, throughout the state that would benefit from uh, this type of legislation. And um, yeah, so uh, I appreciate you guys hearing me and uh, thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the panel? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. I called Peter Nightingale and Daisy Benitez. While they're coming up here, Alice Ramos signed up in favor, not testifying. Richardson Cruz signed up in favor. Uh, Erica Hopewell signed up in favor. Actually, all the witnesses who were signed up on this bill, <laughs> the remainder of the bill was signed up in favor. So I'm just going to read them off as uh, Katie West, Jonathan Daly-Labelle, 
Angela Jeffers and Janine Castillo. All right, you may proceed. I have three more. I have three more pages worth of names. So, okay. so we'll, we'll we'll get to you. Don't worry. So, <laughs> you may proceed. Hi, uh, I'm Peter Nar Peter Nightingale. I'm uh, a physics professor at the University of Rhode Island, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Poor People's Campaign. Um, let me briefly mention what the Poor People's Campaign stands for in Rhode Island and nationally. We base our uh, activities on an analysis that we call the interlocking injustices. Interlocking injustices are things that you cannot deal with one at a time. And they are systemic racism, poverty and equality, the war economy, and ecological devastation. And then finally, there is also the false narrative of relig religious nationalism. Um, we submitted a, a written testimony. I'm not going to uh, go through that in detail, but if you are a graphs person, a chart person, please look at that because there's an interesting graph in there. And I'll just simply mention a number, which is the most recent increase uh, in the consumer price index was that numbers increases over the last six, excuse me, the last year for um, electricity and food have been respectively 9 and 10 percent. Now, if you are at the bottom of the income scale, you don't have that. That's simple as that. And if you lose your utilities, then it's very simple what's going to happen. That is the last step before homelessness in many cases. Now, you might have noticed it's been in the news more than once recently that there is this explosion for in self-storage facilities. Am I the only one who sees a connection? Yeah. I don't think so. So, as always, it's the people at the bottom end who are, in fact, who are affected mostly by this, and disproportionately among them are indigenous people and people of color. Um, now there is something else which I would like to add to this, which is based on a conversation that I had with a friend just in the last couple of days about PIP. And one of the arguments that was presented to her was, well, you know what, I hear from landlords that people turn up their thermostats and open their windows in, in, in the winter. Well. Let me tell you what my response to that is. First of all, that is what, this is what we see in the, in the campaign a lot of. It's called blame the victim. And why am I saying that? For very good reasons, and these are the following. I'm, as I said, a professor of physics. I spent four decades in an office at URI in Kingston, where we were in a building where half of the time people were boiling on one side of the building, and the other half was freezing. And how did it happen? Well, the wind just shifted from one place to another, and there were simply not enough thermostats and not thermostats in the right places to control that. That's me. Now, my wife spent her career in human services. Part of that career she spent in the ACI. In the ACI, in the winter, you go into offices and you see people sit there with fans blowing at them. Why? Because the building is incredibly hot. My office, I remember at, at, at one point, I came in and I had put a thermometer there because I'm a physicist after all, I like numbers. The darn thing read 95 degrees Fahrenheit. My office, I touched my keyboard and it was hot. Um, the other thing, people in state houses shouldn't be throwing stones. Don't they say that? Well, maybe not. But I've walked by this building in the winter more than once. And what I hear is ACs buzzing and buzzing and buzzing and buzzing because people cannot stand the heat in the basement of this building. Maybe that's been fixed, I don't know. Anyway, blame the victim is not something that we should be doing. And so I urge you, please, please, please pass this bill and I'll make a threat also. I'm going to be retiring soon. And if you don't pass this bill, 
I will be on your case 24-7 because I am looking for something to do after retirement. You're smiling. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You may proceed with your testimony. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I just want to say it was mentioned earlier that National Grid has AMP and LIHEAP in place right now for uh, to benefit the low-income community. But I just want to say it's not enough. It's not enough, and the percentage income payment plan, which uh, would be an upgrade for what we already have, it's definitely, uh, there are definitely great programs for which the George Wiley has participated and has been pushing for, but it's still not enough. People are still being shut off, and that's where you can see the impact of how, uh, you know, great these programs are. Yes, they are good, but they're not good enough. Um, and I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> My name is Daisy. I'm a member of the George Wiley Center. And uh, I'm testifying in favor of the bill. As a low-income person, I know what it is to go days, weeks, uh, being food insecure, relying on food pantries, having housing insecurity, unemployment, and so many other difficulties. Um, on top of that, I have high utility rates that I cannot afford. Um, un unaffordable utilities are affecting low-income community members like myself, marginalized groups, elderly people, children, babies, and so many others around Rhode Island, like it has already been mentioned. And while we're sitting here talking about PIP, there is someone out there being shut off. So it's a big problem, especially now with, you know, the summer coming. Uh, people's lives are at stake. People die because they don't have affordable utilities. And, you know, some, as it was also already mentioned before, people um, are deciding whether to feed their children or to pay utilities. Others between paying medical expenses and utilities and so on. People's lives, like I said, are at stake. And it's a humanitarian crisis that needs to be addressed promptly. We're not asking Rhode Island to reinvent the wheel. As it was mentioned, this is a program that has already worked before in the late 18, 1980s and in the early 1990s in Rhode Island and in some states, like Representative Slater already mentioned, it's working now. Uh, in, in Rhode Island, in the past, it reduced some households' heating bills from 48.7% of their income to 8.2%. So it's a great program. And if PIP is brought back to Rhode Island, it would make easier for people to afford basic necessities, you know, because utilities would not be one of our top worries anymore. And the people, the community, were asking that Rhode Island brings back PIP to alleviate our struggles and also to improve the quality of life for all of us, the low-income community. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the panel? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, we have Jonathan De Jesus, Aaron Isaac, and while they're coming up, Ethan Drake signed up in favor, not testifying. Isabel, Isabella Garo signed up in favor, not testifying. Ashton Higgins signed up in favor, not testifying. Annabelle Williams signed up in favor, not testifying. Cecilia Holt signed up in favor, not testifying. Ella, can't read the last name, Singleton. Signed up in favor, not testifying. Kimberly Kent, signed up in favor, not testifying. Erica Reyna Estrada, signed up in favor, not testifying. So we'll go to the witnesses. Ah, it's not. It's the red button up. There you go. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Solman and esteemed members of the committee. Uh, sorry, I'm going off my phone. <laughs> Um, th if you speak from the heart, well, you know, we appreciate that much more, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for allowing me to, uh, the opportunity to testify. My name is Jonathan De Jesus. I am the uh, community policy advocate for Progreso Latino. Uh, Progreso Latino is a nonprofit organization where uh, we provide transformational programs for low-income and immigrant families. Uh, this legislation would have a significant impact on the community we serve. I have some brief testimonies from the community members saying why this legislation is important to them. Uh, we have what's called an adult social action committee. So um, at the adult social action committee, it's a group of community members from Central Falls and Pawtucket. They do a lot of uh, leadership activities. 
they do a lot of work um, of surrounding policy. They like to testify. We educate them and um, and things sur surrounding issues like this. And I'm gonna keep them anonymous, but um, they did write some things, and I would like to share them out to you guys. Uh, PIP is necessary because we need more accessible services to be able to live well and to have a better life since the cost of living has surpassed income, expensive food, and rent has risen a lot. That was one person. Um, these services are very important and we cannot live without them being affordable. Um, PIP is necessary because everything is very costly and we need it everything and also there are people who work two or three jobs just to pay our debts. Um, reducing my utility payments would help me pay for my medicine, food, and other basic needs. PIP is necessary because we struggle to pay for heat, water, and electricity with our small salary. We don't make enough money to cover the rise cost of living. So. As you can see um, from our community, we are um, in the Adult Social Action Committee. There are people who are struggling right now, and um, which is why PIP is important. Thank you. Thank you. You may proceed with your testimony. Identify yourself. Uh, my name is Aaron Isaac. I work with the George Wiley Center. Uh, I'm an organizer there, and I talk to people who are struggling to pay their utilities. I'd like to say three things uh, today, and I'll do it very briefly. Uh, number one, we're in a moment uh, which makes PIP valuable and necessary to pass as soon as possible. Number two, I believe that uh, Rhode Island Energy can also benefit from PIP. And number three, uh, I just want to talk about a couple of cases that I've had, obviously not identifying anyone, uh, but I believe their stories are important. Uh, the, the first point, I won't labor on because we've heard already prices are going up, whether you look at housing, energy, uh, food, what have you. Uh, but I will say that uh, one of the things I've seen, and I've uh, said, I believe I've said this in the written testimony I've uh, given out, is that despite a forgiveness program, uh, which I know many clients were uh, uh, grateful for, uh, delinquency in accounts has been going up uh, since I believe November. Uh, the exact number as I counted from the uh, uh, reported low income monthly report to the PUC uh, was 29,000 accounts uh, who have fallen into delinquency since that time. Uh, I'd, but I'd like to move to my second point, which was that I don't believe that I'm at, anyone's asking anyone to act out of pure altruism. Uh, controlling the bill price, which PIP would do, of energy will allow consumers to make consistent and timely payments. One of the arguments that have been made in favor of PIP, for PIP uh, in other states, has been that it would allow low-income people to pay uh, sustainably payable bills. The that specifically means that when a low-income customer receives his or her bill for utility service, that customer will have the capacity to pay that bill in a complete and timely manner. Uh, and that would reduce the onus that Rhode Island Energy has in collection efforts or uh, having to refer that account to a, a collection agency. Uh, I finally like to talk about uh, the, the cases that I've had to deal with. Um, Programs like AMP, uh, the Arrearage Management Plan, have been one of my go-tos to help people. I personally think it is a fantastic program. Uh, however, I would note, uh, as I've also given in the written testimony, that more people default on the AMP program than complete it. Uh, and I've given the, the, there's a graph at the end of my written testimony that they'll lay that out. We are already, in the last three months, uh, defaults have already outpaced completion. That seems to me to suggest that our current AMP program is not enough. And I have experienced that firsthand when I am on the phone with someone 
and I realized midway through the conversation, I have already talked to them months prior. I have already signed them up to the AMP program, and they are calling me again because despite the, the reduction in, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. <laughs> Uh, despite the reduction in their, uh, in their bill, they still can't manage to pay it. Lots of different people come to the George Wiley Center. Uh, landlords come to us. Uh, Full-time workers come to us. Uh, but some of the people who suffer the most from increases in energy bills have been the disabled, have been the retired, the elderly, people who work on a fixed income or try to survive on a fixed income. And I don't, I don't want to seem theatrical, but I, I'm not joking when I say uh, I have people crying on the phone because they don't know how they're going to pay their bill. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the witnesses? Thank you very much for your testimony. We have Benny Grayson. And we have Representative Stewart in the back. And while they're coming to the microphone, I apologize. There's a, there's a few names I can't read on here. Mason signed up in favor, not testifying. St. Pierre signed up in favor, not testifying. Ethan Rioran signed up in favor, not testifying. Leo Major signed up in favor of not testifying. You may proceed, Representative. Great. Button up. Okay, that's right. I should know this by now. Um, and thank you so much, uh, members of the Corporations Committee. I'll keep my remarks uh, brief um, so you can hear uh, more from members of the community who are here tonight. Um, and I also don't want to uh, repeat some of the points that have already been made. But I'd just like to point out, as I was sitting in the back uh, listening to the testimony on some of the preceding bills, there was a lot of um, comments about uh, Rhode Island being in kind of a sad situation um, with respect to things like reimbursements or attracting uh, physicians or other professionals um, that, you know, it's been sort of last on the uh, list or near so in those areas and that a crisis um, you can sort of see a mile away uh, over many decades uh, developing. And in some ways, this problem of utilities affordability is not different, right? Um, uh, insofar as we've known for a long time that this has been a problem and for uh, a variety of reasons have chosen not to deal with it. Um, but the thing that I think might be different in this case is that, as was, was pointed out earlier, in the late 80s and 90s, Rhode Island experimented and actually decided to see what it could do about this affordability problem um, with respect to um, utilities. And it's kind of wild to think that instead of the kind of sad sack position Rhode Island uh, is in in some areas that we've heard earlier tonight. This was an area in which Rhode Island had been a, well, an innovator, right? With its experiment, uh, its pilot study um, for PIP in uh, Warwick. And so, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons that I'm actually kind of curious about as a history teacher, we decided not to um, expand that program. But we do have an opportunity, I think, now to be inspired by our own past and um, know that this is a problem that uh, we've experimented uh, before previously and um, had some impressive results, as had already been pointed out. And we can do that again. And how wild would it be that 
uh, not only can we be inspired by our own past to deal with this problem, but we can allow ourselves to be inspired by states who were inspired by us decades ago um, to, to do something. So um, anyway, I just wanted to point those things out. And I, I thank you for the opportunity um, to speak before you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Are there any questions for Representative Stewart? Seeing none, thank you so much. John Gallagher and Camilo Viveros. Did, uh, be did Benny leave as well? Benny Grayson? Okay. All right. John? Red button. Good evening. I'm a long-standing member of the George Wiley Center. Uh, I haven't been going to uh, the Wiley Center meetings for a while. I do work for a living. Uh, but I was there when uh, Henry Shelton was the coordinator. And uh, I even have Henry Shelton on my shoulder, still pushing me. <laughs> I didn't want to come here, really. <laughs> but... Uh, Oh, we're glad you did, so. Thank you. Um, I have a memory of, of uh, Henry explaining to us uh, about the PIP bill. And uh, I'd like to um, allay the fears of, uh, you know, anybody that's a recipient of PIP would be would be leaving the you know leaving their utilities on and opening the windows and wasting electricity and gas and whatever. Oh, I hate I hate wasting stuff like that anyway. But basically, he said, "Well, even if you have like fifty percent off, you you you're still paying. Uh, you still your bill is still." reflective of how much you use, how much electricity or gas you use. So they're not motivated to waste it because they still have to pay more the more they use, for one thing. Um, I had it in my mind. I said, well, let me, let me grab a few. Uh, let me compare. I, I, like to, I like to see correlations and things. Let me see if there's a correlation of the states that have the PEP and see if there's a, a, a greater number of, of shutoffs in the, in the states that don't have PEP. And um, I came across, this, this is old, January 2014. It has a, a brief synopsis of eight states that use uh, PEP. It's kind of... Um, Interesting because a lot of them put. Right, did you say eight states? Eight states, but, uh, and this uh, is old. And I'll and I, okay, I'll be happy yeah. to hand these to the committee. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I heard uh, Senator Slater mention something about a cap. Illinois and New Jersey both cap uh, customers at eighteen hundred dollars annually. So that's the most that they're going to get, 1800 So that could allay the fears of anybody wasting electricity or gas or whatever utility they use. Here's a report by the Center for Biological Diversity. And they took data about only 10 states had data uh, during the years of COVID, during the year when the COVID was the highest. Um, most states, like Rhode Island, does offer data on on uh, how many shutoffs. I don't think it lists the people's names, but it has a data on numbers. Uh, but we had a moratorium during COVID. A lot of states had a moratorium over COVID. So there were 10 states, according to this article, that, had, um, that didn't have a moratorium, and they had a list of number of shutoffs. 
And uh, the leading number of shutoffs was Florida, 320,000 shutoffs. This is a one-year period. And uh, second was Georgia, 131,000 shutoffs, which, which amounts to about 6% of the population. So that's 6% of the population in Georgia that were shut off. Uh, so it reflects a, a big um, a crisis, an economic crisis. Georgia and Florida don't have a PIP plan. Here's two states that have a PIP plan, Colorado and Pennsylvania, and I'll read off how many shutoffs were there because they didn't have a moratorium. Okay. Good thing I remember my uh, alphabet. <laughs> know which order to go through. Pennsylvania, which has a PIP program, had 1,921 shutoffs. And um, the other one is Colorado, and it's close to 2,000. But comparatively, Florida, 320,000 compared to two states that uh, didn't have a moratorium and that keep records of the amount of shutoffs and, and make it public. They've had like 1,000, 2,000. Um, I also have a copy of a, this is an article from CNN reporting from the uh, CNN business perspectives, and it's April 28, 2022. So it's a year old. And it says that more than 20,000 families are currently behind on their utility bills, owing about $23 billion. So um, basically, this, the author of this, Mark Wolf, uh, he's an energy economist and serves as the uh, executive director of the National Energy Assistance Directors Association. And basically in the article, I heard, I, heard, I heard the question in another bill say, what is the solution? Well, here's what one of his solutions is. Um, the cap energy cost for households based on their ability to to, to cap energy costs for households based on their ability to pay. Uh, these percentage of income payment plans, PIP, guarantee a household will never owe more than they can afford for energy. Then it says in the state picks up the rest of the tab. Well, you know, that. how does the state pick up the rest of the tab? Uh, as I recall from going to meetings in the past, Wiley Center meetings, and I haven't gone recently, uh, there would be a surcharge of 1% to people who were, I guess it was the top 10%, I, if I recall correctly, of, uh, of, in, of uh, corporations that reside in the state and, peop and households. So a little bit like... Uh, I can't remember the uh, Robin Hood. <laughs> Only I wouldn't call it stealing. But we don't want to be stealing from anyone. No, so. <laughs> we don't. But we don't want to leave anybody in the in the six percent in Georgia is a lot. I don't know what the percentage is in in Rhode Island to tell you honest truth, but we don't want to be anywhere near there. Well, all right, I'm thank done. You. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none. Thank you very much for your testimony. Okay. Um, David Zunga signed up, signed up in favor of not testifying. Juan Pablo Ocampo signed up in favor of not testifying. And that concludes the hearing on House Bill 5847. just want to thank uh, everyone for coming out here today on that. So thank you. Um,